Welcome to this session on the treatment of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. I'm Dr. Alan Rook, professor of dermatology from the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I would like to present to you today a brief discussion on the treatments that we are currently using, the old and the new. Uh, and we are presently dealing with a formidable foe in the malignant T-cell that causes uh, cutaneous lymphomas. And why is this condition cutaneous or skin-based? And the condition is skin-based because the malignant T-cells are endowed with a variety of surface features that permit these cells to gain entry into the skin and to be attracted up to the upper layers of the skin uh, so that the conditions manifest within the skin uh, and ultimately can be diagnosed as cutaneous lymphomas. Uh, so the cells express, the malignant T cells in mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome characteristically express several cell surface proteins that permit these cells to stick to the blood vessel walls in the skin and to gain entry into the skin uh, and then subsequently have an opportunity to respond to factors that are made in the epidermis that recruit these cells high up into the skin. So that when we look at a skin biopsy from patients, the average patient with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, what we observe are uh, active T-cells uh, in the upper layers of the uh, dermis, uh, uh, crowding up against the epidermis, the upper layer of the skin, and entering into the epidermis so that the ac action, so to speak, the pathologic action, where we can find the abnormal T cells in cutaneous lymphomas in the majority of cases of mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, are located high up in the skin. And that is somewhat advantageous because it permits us to use a variety of skin-directed therapies, so-called, that have immediate access to those cells because of the very nature of their location high up in the skin. So it is our job, then, to develop a constellation of treatment plans that can lead to eradication of those malignant T cells in the skin. We have some general features of our treatment plan that we follow. One is, whenever possible, we utilize immune modulatory approaches so that we do not uh, dampen the immune response, but conversely, so that we can directly stimulate the immune response because one of the general features of most cases of cutaneous T cell lymphoma is that the immune response uh, plays an important role in control of cutaneous lymphomas. Whenever possible or whenever feasible, we use so-called multimodality approaches, which means that we use more than just a single approach. We might combine a skin-targeted approach along with a pro an approach that utilizes systemic therapy that can target uh, the abnormal cells that are circulating in the blood. Uh, and so that we use more than one approach referred to as a multimodality approach. And because in certain forms of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, uh, there's an increased risk for skin infections, particularly with bacteria, uh, we treat these infections when they occur, whenever it is feasible. One important uh, feature to remember is that cutaneous T cell lymphoma is highly responsive to immune modulation. So as I review our constellations of therapies, you will see that many of these therapies not only support the immune response, they directly work by activating our own immune response. So in this first patient that I show you who has so-called T1 disease, or patches or plaques 
involving less than 10% of the skin surface area. And in this case that I'm showing you, uh, uh, patches and plaques located in the so-called bathing trunk area. These patients have localized disease and we can utilize a variety of skin-directed therapies that are shown on this slide here. And let's review some of these. There are potent topical steroids, nitrogen mustard ointment, carmistine ointment, Naraband UVB, PUVA, topical retinoids, which come in the form of bexarotene and tazarotene, and imiquimod cream. Let's spend some time reviewing all of these, each of which is completely appropriate under various situations for the treatment of so-called T1 or limited patch or plaque disease, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Firstly, let's discuss potent topical steroids. These are corticosteroids that come in creams, ointments, and gels. They can eliminate the malignant T cells in the skin by directly killing them. Uh, malignant T cells are responsive to corticosteroids. So when you place these on the skin, they can be of modest efficacy. Sometimes, when we are fortunate, they can eliminate completely the skin lesions, but the duration of response may have variable duration and of modest efficacy. In other words, we often use topical corticosteroids and can clear lesions, but they often return. Topical corticosteroids are quite useful as so-called mop-up agents. Uh, there are some therapies that we use that may not get into protected areas, such as in the groin or around the rear end or buttocks or in the armpits. For instance, when we use certain forms of light therapy or phototherapy, there may be residual areas of skin involvement that require mop-up therapy. And potent topical steroids can be quite useful as mop-up therapy. Topical steroids can be very useful for itching. And uh, we frequently do use topical steroids in an effort to alleviate itch. It is important to understand that one reason why we don't use on a chronic basis potent topical steroids is that they can lead to skin thinning, also known as skin atrophy. We make very frequent use of topical chemotherapy and one form of topical chemotherapy is topical nitrogen mustard. Uh, it comes in various strengths. We usually start with the lowest known effective strength, which is 0.01% topical nitrogen mustard. It has a very high degree of efficacy. Uh, it must be compounded by a compounding pharmacy under its current regimen. Uh, it is anticipated in the future there may be new formulations of this in the form of a gel, which will be less greasy than the currently available ointment. It's important to understand that although it's termed topical chemotherapy, topical nitrogen mustard is not absorbed through the skin, but is effective in the high portions of the skin where the abnormal cells are typically located. So it produces a high response rate for most patients with patches or plaques. It is important to know that one of the main side effects of this is allergy. So it can produce contact dermatitis in about one out of five people who use it. And the main signs of contact dermatitis are itching and redness uh, occurring after the application of the topical nitrogen mustard. This usually occurs reasonably early in the course of using this, usually within about four to six weeks of initiation of nitrogen mustard. It remains an expensive compound, uh, and uh, we have to work very carefully with insurance companies in an effort to assure adequate reimbursement for topical nitrogen mustard. Uh, in terms of topical carmistine, uh, this is another form of effective topical chemotherapy. It's also known as topical BCNU. 
It is useful in several different concentrations. Uh, it's a very effective topical chemotherapy uh, when we use it to try to clear patches or plaques. Its side effects include the development of small spider veins in the skin, which occasionally do not uh, resolve upon discontinuation of the carmistine. Uh, that is the basis for not wanting to use carmistine on the face of our patients. Uh, it, also can, and, uh, it also can cause increased pigmentation in areas of application. Usually the increased pigmentation signifies clearing uh, of the inflammatory aspect of a lesion. Otherwise, as an ointment, it's very safe and re uh, it's highly recommended in the current concentrations of 0.03 or 0.04% ointment. Another uh, very effective form of skin-targeted therapy is narrowband ultraviolet B, also known as narrowband UVB. It is a very narrow wavelength of ultraviolet light uh, that is quite effective in clearing patches and thin plaques, but it is not effective for thick plaques because its penetration deep into the skin is quite limited. So it is considered excellent therapy for patches and thin plaques. One of the main side effects, because it's a form of ultraviolet therapy, is it can cause a so-called sunburn or ultraviolet burn. So it has to be used cautiously and administered carefully uh, by staff who understand how to administer it. Its long-term use uh, can be undertaken as a maintenance therapy. It is associated under long-term use with a slightly increased risk of other types of skin cancers. So nevertheless, it can be used effectively as a type of maintenance therapy for patients who have frequent recurrences. Perhaps an even more effective therapy for clearing skin lesions is PUVA, which stands for Sorolin plus UVA ultraviolet light. It produces very high response rates. Its efficacy is good for thick plaques as well because it penetrates deeply into the skin. Uh, its efficacy is increased with interferon or oral targretin. It's also beneficial for patients who have leukemic versions of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And when I say leukemic, that means blood involvement. It can be used for patients who have uh, uh, Cesare syndrome in addition to treating not only the skin. It can provide some benefit for circulate, eliminating circulating malignant T-cells. One of the known side effects is you can also receive an ultraviolet burn, uh, so it must be administered uh, very cautiously under the guidance of uh, healthcare providers who understand how to administer it. Its long-term use can be associated with risk of other kinds of skin cancers, including squamous cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma, so we uh, attempt to undertake a short course uh, of therapy. If an extended course of therapy is, is required, then it is best to use it in combination with other very active therapeutic agents, such as an interferon or oral targretin. It can be used on an infrequent basis, perhaps once a month, as maintenance therapy for people who are frequent relapsers in an effort to maintain patients in remission. Other topical therapies include a miquimod cream, which directly stimulates in the skin uh, an immune cell referred to as a dendritic cell. And by stimulating that cell in the skin, it leads to immune activation in the skin with the release of interferon and other beneficial compounds from the dendritic cell to directly stimulate killer T cells that can inhibit the growth of the abnormal T cells that are the causative agents of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Targretin gel is also an effective topical agent. 
Uh, it is a vitamin A compound in the form of a gel that can help kill the malignant T cells in the skin. Uh, but it is quite irritating, as is a Miquimod cream, so it can only be utilized on a very localized area of the skin. So we recommend not using a Miquimod and Targretin gel on very sensitive areas, such as in the groin and under the arms, but it, they are safe to use on most other parts of the skin anatomy. Tazerac or Tazeratine cream and gel is also a vitamin A or retinoid gel. And just like Targretin gel, it can be quite effective in eliminating abnormal T cells in the skin. But just like Targretin gel and Amicomod is rather irritating uh, and can only be used on small areas of the skin at any one time.